uh, uh, this year, uh, two independent committee uh, um, uh, nominated Claire uh, Miller Ferguson as a winner of both prizes, so we have only one talk for both. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very good prize, you know, for uh, good award for uh, the two of them, and we are really delighted to have Claire to make the nice presentation, and we congratulate her for, for winning the two awards, and I think it's a pleasure to introduce her for, uh, for, for, for speaking. Is this a, we, Come on, Claire. Sorry. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I'll sit. It's okay. So I can see. You, you, need, you need this? I might be okay. You can see. Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you very much to Tylee, Tylee, Ty Wiley for this Best Paper Award and also to the Society and the organisation here for allowing us to present our paper. We need it, um, we need it for the... For the offer this, okay, the no problem. <laughs> So this work was originally started as part of Kelly Gallagher's PhD, and then it was continued as part of the EPSRC Secure Network. So this was funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK. And the Secure Network was to bring together environmental scientists and statisticians. So as part of this, we had Kelly on the work, myself, Marion Scott, who's also in the audience from University of Glasgow. Robert Willows, who originally was at the Environment Agency in England, in the UK, and now has an honorary position with ourselves at Glasgow. And also Linda Pope and John Douglas from the Environment Agency. So just to give a bit of background, first of all, and motivate all of this work. We're working in the area of fresh waters, specifically thinking about river water quality. And we're thinking about measuring river nutrient levels. So we've been looking at phosphates and nitrates, and we want to monitor and manage the levels of the phosphates and nitrates to keep them at acceptable levels. Now, in this picture here, this would be an example of where we've got very poor water quality. The nutrients have become abundant in the water and eutrophication has taken place. So we have algae or algal scums going over the water body. This can deplete the water of oxygen and can be detrimental to both plants and animals. Another issue here is that the algae can bring with it toxic scums and this can be very detrimental to animal and both human health. So various reasons why we want to monitor and manage nutrient levels within rivers, but also we have to currently report to Europe under these directives. This may well change with Brexit, we don't know what will happen, but at the moment we have to show that we are complying with both the Water Framework Directive and, for example, the Nitrates Directive in terms of the level of the nutrients within the water. So this is just an overview to the rest of the presentation. I'm going to give you a bit of a background to the statistical approach and how we actually came about working in the area and then introduce the main method in the paper, which is what we've called space-time principal components analysis. I'll then give an application for a particular river network, and hopefully there'll be a bit of time for me to tell you a little bit more generally about my wider research area. So the background to the approach, we're thinking about river networks. Now, in this particular example, we had hundreds of monitoring sites which had been manually sampled over time. Now, obviously, there are lots of different mechanisms for obtaining data just now, automatic sensors, remote sensing, and we've been looking at a lot of those different data types in other projects. 
But at the moment, the Environment Agency still has pretty much all of its sites as manual in situ locations. So for example, at these hundreds of sites across a network, we're interested in measuring the nutrient levels. And one of the key aspects for this paper and this presentation is the connectedness. So the sites are connected through the river structure, they're connected through the landscape, and also connected over time. And so with part of this, we were interested in, could there actually be redundancies in this information? Because we're going to have lots of similar information at sites that are close together or time points that are close together, driven by various different factors. So this really motivated a lot of the work that Kelly did as part of her PhD originally. And so Kelly looked at using river network structure in order to estimate, in particular, common temporal patterns over the river network. Key questions that she thought about were, can we identify these common patterns? If we can, does that mean that we could actually reduce this down and just think about the information we would get from a sample of these monitoring sites? And if we do that, then what's the effect? What's the effect on the predictions that we get? And of course, the associated standard errors. So thinking first of all about identifying common spatial and temporal patterns. Why might we want to do that? Well, if we can identify these dominant patterns, we might be able to identify time points where water quality has remained stable over time or has been particularly variable. Or we might want to identify groups of monitoring sites that exhibit similar temporal patterns. And if we could do that, then potentially future monitoring could be targeted at these locations so that we don't have to continue with hundreds of manual monitoring sites. So for example, could we use this information either to reduce the current network or to think about where we might place automatic sensors? But the challenge here is the amount of similar information that we have. If we just look for common spatial and temporal patterns, then we'll actually see that we have lots of sites that appear to give us the same temporal pattern and lots of time points that appear to give us the same spatial pattern. And so we were interested in looking at this and trying to see, well, can we account for more of this spatial and temporal correlation to actually unmask data features and actually see the key points in the network that are driving the patterns that we see? Thinking about this in a bit more detail, for our nutrients, nutrients are dispersed either through diffuse sources or through point sources. So if it's through diffuse sources, then the nutrients might seep from the surrounding landscape. If it's through a point source, for example, it might be a sewage treatment works leaking directly into the river at that point. So this gives us different layers in terms of the correlation. For the spatial correlation, we've got our immediate surrounding land use sleeping into the river, but we've also got what happened upstream. So we need to think about the river distance and the connectedness. In addition to that, because we're looking at patterns over time, we're going to have temporal correlation. So that's the background, that's what we're trying to do. We're thinking about can we identify these common spatial and temporal patterns, but can we account for these different layers of spatial and temporal correlation in order to try and identify the key points of a network that are really explaining the variability. So our approach then was what we've called space-time principal components analysis. And I'll take you through that in general terms, first of all, and then think specifically about how we define our spatial and temporal weights. Okay, so our data are recorded at several monitoring points over time. 
Initially, we're going to start just by thinking about principal components analysis and use this to identify either dominant sites or dominant temporal patterns. But we're going to modify the PCA. We're going to modify it so that we try and whiten. We try and remove some of these additional layers of correlation and hopefully unmask some of the data features. So just a bit of an introduction to a couple of the modes of PCA that have been around in the literature for a long time now. This, for example, would be T-mode PCA in this particular example. So we're not talking about a situation where we have lots of different variables. We only have one variable, our nutrients, that we're interested in here. And so a T-mode PCA would be where we have our time points as our columns and our sites in the rows. And if we have it in this construction, then what we're saying is we're trying to identify dominant spatial patterns and the associated time points that actually explain the variability in those patterns. So we're combining together the information across time with high loadings at a particular time point, indicating that that time point is where we're explaining a lot of that spatial pattern. The one I'm going to focus more on, though, is the S-mode PCA. Both modes are talked about within the paper, but I'll just talk about this one specifically today. So with the S mode, we just turn things around. With the S mode, our X matrix, we would have our sites in our columns and our times in our rows. And here we're interested in estimating our dominant temporal patterns. So we want to try and estimate these patterns and see which sites explain the variability in those patterns. So for our general construction, first of all, starting with the PCA, we're just doing a singular value decomposition of our X matrix, whichever form you happen to be taking it in. And then we're going to adjust it. So we're going to build in weights in order to adjust for our structure here, both in time and in space. So we build in a matrix omega and a matrix phi. So that now we're working with this matrix X tilde. So we do the same thing. We do our single value decomposition in order to come up with our PCs. But this would then give us PCs that are associated with X tilde instead of our original X matrix. And so through works such as Alan et al, we can do a back transformation in order to get back to our original X matrix, but still incorporating these additional matrices. An intermediate step here is we think about reconstructing our matrix X tilde. So we decide the number of PCs that we want to use and we reconstruct X tilde using our particular number of PCs and our reconstruction error. And then when, once we've done that, we can do our transformation back the way in order to get our PCs and loadings related to X. So we can pre and post multiply again by our weight matrices, just to get back to our original X matrix. So that's just the very general construction. We're taking a PCA, we're modifying it using different weight matrices. But the key thing here is really thinking about what these weight matrices are and how we might come up with that. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm just going to focus on the S mode. So I'm going to focus on the situation where we're trying to identify the dominant temporal patterns and the sites that are really explaining those patterns. And so for that, we have a temporal weight matrix phi and a spatial weight matrix omega that we need to construct. So I'm going to start with the spatial weight matrix. And in order to come up with the weights here, we use the work of Aaron Peterson and Jay Verhoof. And for anyone that was in Ashley's talk yesterday, Ashley gave a really nice introduction to the stream network models that they fit. 
So we are not using the spatial stream network models here, but we are still using their ideas in order to come up with an appropriate weight matrix for our spatial correlation. And so the idea is that we want to take account of the fact that we have our upstream monitoring sites and they're going to influence our downstream monitoring sites. So in order to do that, we've got two things that we're really interested in. We're interested in the strength of the flow and we're interested in the connectedness of the river structure. Now, the connectedness of the river structure is fairly obvious how we would identify that. In order to come up with the strength of the flow, though, it can sometimes be more complicated because you don't always have that information available. Usually, we think about discharge instead of flow, where discharge is the volume of water that's passing through a particular point within a given time. But again, you wouldn't necessarily always have all of that information for your full river network or for the full amount of area that you're dealing with. And so Peterson and Verhoof suggest that we can use the watershed area as a proxy in order to come up with our weights here. So the watershed area is just the area of land that drains directly to a stream segment. So I've just done a very simple diagram here. And next slide. And so here I've just got three stream segments. So the black lines are my three stream segments. The red points are the sites and the green areas are the watershed areas. So for example, in this area here, this is the area that drains directly to this stream segment and enhance to site A1. So the first thing that we do is we think about the proportional influence of the stream segments upstream. And so here we would think about the water that's draining to this particular stream segment relative to the water that's draining to this stream segment. So in my diagram, we've got a lighter flow here than we have here. So we can come up, just through some simple calculations, with the proportional influence of each of our stream segments based on the watershed area. Once we've done that, we then want to think about accumulating this as we move along the river. So in this case, it's obviously very simple because I only have three segments, but what we want to do is to combine the information. So we'll have our influence here, which is our water that's drained to this stream segment. And we combine that with our influence here, the water draining to that stream segment, in order to see what's the influence all the way down this part of the network. So this allows us to come up with a weight matrix in order to incorporate the spatial information. So what we actually do is we develop an asymmetric weight matrix, and this is where the connectivity is coming in. And so we only have weights in this matrix where our sites are flow connected. And the weights themselves are then developed on the basis of these additive function values. So this accumulation of the water draining through the network. And so this is how we come up with our omega matrix for space. The time matrix in some senses is more straightforward and in our case we've just done this very simply. So in our case we just thought about thinking about ARIMA type structures here and so we've actually just built in an AR1 type structure to describe what's happening over time. And so we come up with our matrix phi. Okay, so that, that's our approach, basically. We've got this PCA. We're adjusting our PCA based on these phi and omega matrices, which we define to be our spatial weights and our temporal weights. And we hope that when we do that, it's going to help us to identify sites which are actually driving particular temporal patterns. 
Okay, so in the application here, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background and then I'm actually going to start with some previous work that we did in this area, just to let you see how this all kind of came about in terms of thinking about these common patterns. So the Environment Agency and our colleagues that are co-authors on this paper are what we would refer to as the competent authority responsible for monitoring the environment within England. We do have a similar body within Scotland, SEPA, and we do a lot of work with them as well, but it just so happened that for this paper, it's been the work with the English Environment Agency. Their key role or their key responsibility is to improve and maintain the river water quality, and as well on that basis, to report to Europe. And in terms of the data that's available at the moment, We'd been looking originally at data over about a 20 to 30 year period, recorded approximately fortnightly to monthly and at 8,000 monitoring sites all across here. So a huge amount of information. So this was original work that we had done in this area. And what we did originally was to look at what the Environment Agency referred to as separate large hydrological areas. So this is England and Wales, broken up into 59 large hydrological areas. And they believe that each of these large hydrological areas are basically independent. And that's how they would treat them. And so what we did originally to explore and see what was going on was to estimate the temporal and the spatial trends and seasonal patterns for nutrients, phosphate, total oxidised nitrogen in each of these 59 large hydrological areas. We did that through developing a series of generalised additive models by using functional data analysis approaches and that's what really got us to thinking about the amount of redundancy that's possibly there and the common patterns that we actually have within all of this information over space and time. So just to give you a small example of the, the results here, these are results for orthophosphate. So phosphate just being a nutrient in, the, in our water. And for example, here we have the seasonal pattern. Now, what's summarised here in the light grey, which you might just be able to see, is actually the 59 seasonal pattern fitted curves that we had from our models and just a functional mean and functional standard deviations. And then in the right here, it's just showing you a very small number of them that were functional outliers in this area. So you can see that for seasonality, it's very, very clear in terms of the pattern that we've got for the orthophosphate. Down the bottom, this was an example for the temporal trend. I've just shown the functional mean of the 59 areas, functional standard deviations. And again, there were just a small number of areas where there was something slightly different happening. Although, again, as you can see, it's still very much in line with what we see for the majority of the areas. And this one is just the, the overall spatial pattern, the average that we got there. So this was part of what started to motivate really thinking about this idea of the common patterns. And additionally, we really wanted to go within the network and build in the river network structure in a way in order to estimate this. So this is an example for the River Trent. So the River Trent area is in the Midlands of England. And you can see it's a very large network. It's covering quite a lot of the Midlands of England and covering quite a lot of different areas in terms of highlands, lowlands, population centres and so on. 566 monitoring sites across the network and the data were monthly between 1990 and 2010 that we looked at. Now, of course, there were some missing data. There was about approximately 30% missing. And usually for a PCA approach, you wouldn't be able to go ahead with missing data. But what we did in this particular instance was just to use this miss MDA approach, which was actually keeping it very much in line with the other work that we were doing. 
The MIST MDA approach is a principal components analysis. Essentially, it fills in initially the missing values just by taking the column mean, and then it estimates the PC scores, and it iterates round until you get convergence for those missing values. So there's obviously lots of different ways that you could do that, but this, we felt, was something that was in line with the rest of the approach. This is just to let you see some of the data. Now, I've cheated a little bit here just to make it a little bit clearer. And it's not actually the data that I'm showing you here. This is actually the results from a model. So um, again, following what Ashley presented yesterday, this is from fitting the Peterson and Verhoof spatial stream network models in order to predict across the network. And so we have predictions in this one, and we have standard errors in this one. And I've just shown you here just what's happening in winter as we move over time for the movie. Now, the dominant thing you actually see here is actually the monitoring sites moving in and out and not really the color changing very much. So you can see that there is a lot of common pattern here. It's subtle in terms of the changes in the actual nutrient levels. Okay, so we're going to apply our space-time approach. This is what we did in the paper. We applied it to the natural log of total oxidized nitrogen, our nutrient, 566 monitoring sites, monthly between 1990 and 2010. We did our weighted principal components analysis, and the approach has helped us to reveal some of the hidden structure. Spatial weights, just to summarise what we did. So again, we've used this area of land draining to our stream segment as our proxy for discharge, built in the monitoring site connectedness, and these particular values for the weights were calculated using Peterson and Verhoof's STARS package in ArcGIS. And as I mentioned, for the temporal weights, quite a straightforward approach here. We've just built in an AR1 structure. So this is just to let you see what happens with the principal components, first of all. So three different lines in the results here. So the first one, this is our S-mode PCA, where we don't build in any weighting. And I've just given you the percentage variability explained for PC1, PC2, PC3. So that's for our three PCs overall. I'll come back to this in a second. The next one we've got is our SPCA just with the spatial weighting and then the SPCA with the matrices built in for both space and time. So we can see here that in the original one, if you like, we explained 57% of the variability and then it's going down to 43% with our space-time approach. Over here, this is the number of principal components to explain approximately 70% of the variability. So in the standard, we would get eight, it goes up to 12, and then goes up to 23. Now, the reason for this, the reason that we get less variation explained for the earlier PCs and that we need more PCs to explain the same amount of variability is because we've teased out these patterns. We've now teased out the patterns amongst the principal components so that we can try and identify for a particular temporal pattern that we see at a principal component, what were the main sites that were driving that temporal pattern. This helps us to see what's going on here a little bit more clearly. So two pictures. This is just standard S mode PCA on the left, and this is our space time PCA on the right. What you're looking at here is just a particular section of the river that I've zoomed in on. And so for this part of the river, we're flowing down this way here. And at each site here, instead of showing the monitoring site, we've just got a small glyph. So in our vertical, we've got our PC1. PC2 loadings, and PC3 loadings. 
Okay, so focusing on this, first of all, while you can see that there's slight differences in the loadings for PC1, PC2, and PC3, the general overview is that it's pretty much the same. If we were looking at the temporal patterns associated with each of the PCs here, it looks as though the sites here are all explaining the variability in roughly a similar way. When we build in the weighting, so when we do the space-time PCA, what we get is now over on the right-hand side. So now what we can see is that our loadings down here are all very much smaller than the loadings up here, particularly for our PC1 and for PC2. And so this is showing us that for our PC1 and our PC2, the temporal patterns identified there are being explained more by these sites further upstream. So this was the main approach and the main results that were coming through in the paper. What we were able to do was to try and strip out, tease out some of the patterns here to identify the main sites that were really driving the patterns. Because we felt if we could do that, then, for example, it might be of more interest just to look at monitoring sites up here or, for example, have an automatic sensor here rather than in this situation where you don't really know where you need your sensor to be. We then moved on a little bit from that, though, because a big part of this work with the Environment Agency has been thinking about, well, how do we make this all as user-friendly as possible? How can they use the results to actually influence what they're doing? And so one of the things that we looked at was then to move on to clustering the PC loadings to see if, in fact, we can pull out a couple of the key temporal patterns that can then also be associated with these sites that we're now identifying from our space-time PCA. So this is just one example for summer log TON over the time period. It actually pulls out to be four clusters if we cluster our PC loadings. The red and the orange, there's not very much going on, but what's more interesting for them is the different patterns that we're getting here in our green cluster and particularly in our blue cluster. So more of an indication as to where they might want to focus the monitoring or to try and identify what's actually driving those patterns. We do have a early-ish version of an R package available, STPCA. At the moment, it's available on our university site because we're still working on all of this and integrating these new tools and developing them. But it is fully ready in terms of identifying the common spatial temporal patterns and thinking about how you might use that to reduce the monitoring network. Okay, so the space-time PCA then, just to conclude from, from this part of the presentation, it enables users to identify either dominant spatial or temporal patterns. I focused on the S mode, but the paper looks at T mode examples as well. It lets us look at areas of the network where the water quality might have remained more stable or to identify our monitoring locations where we have the same temporal pattern. And such information could be really important to help to redesign networks or to think about the placement of automatic monitoring sensors, which is a really big piece of work going on within the Environment Agency just now and I'm sure is similar across the world. What we've started to do, I'm sure like many others, is to see how much we can do with our Shiny in this area. And so we've been building these tools into our Shiny applications because this makes it much more easy for the Environment Agency to actually engage with them and actually use the results. So that's ongoing work in this space at the moment. So that was really a bit of a summary of the paper and some of the results of the paper. A little bit of a look forward. Um, what I would like to do just in the remaining time is just to tell you a little bit about 
the wider research area that myself and my group are, are working in because the river network application here is obviously just one component of all of that. A lot of work that we do does come under this banner of monitoring fresh water quality and the challenges from that, um, particularly looking across both lakes and rivers. So I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it's not just this more, if you like, classical or historic type data set that we've been looking at. We now obviously have a full range and spectrum of data in all of the applications that we look at, moving from our in situ to automatic buoys to remote sensing. And so we have lots of challenges there in terms of the calibration and the validation of the data and the data fusion, things that have been touched on a lot throughout the conference already. The kind of general questions that we're interested in, regardless of the application, are the spatial temporal patterns, what drives those patterns? So can we actually attribute what's going on? And of course, the level of uncertainty that's attached to it all. So the first project that I just wanted to tell you a little bit about here is a project called Global Lakes. And Global Lakes is a large consortium project in the UK, but we do have many international partners as well. And it's funded through the Natural Environment Research Council. And we at Glasgow are the statistical team really on the project doing the, the statistical developments and analysis. So for this, we're looking at satellite data from 1,000 lakes across the world. The definition, if you like, of the lakes is that they are all larger than 50 kilometres squared. So we go right up to Lake Superior being our largest lake that we're dealing with. We're interested in water quality data, and so the data that we're looking at are chlorophyll levels, so high chlorophyll aiming towards poorer water quality. And the data come from MERIS, so medium resolution imaging spectrometer. So for that, we have data between about 2002 and 2012. Unfortunately, one month before our project started, the MERIS instrument got lost. So that was slightly unfortunate, but we do still have 10 years of good data. The MERIS instrument is on the European Space Agency's Envisat platform. The images that we have are approximately 300 meter resolution. And in order to get a, a reasonable product to work with, we're working at the bi-weekly, monthly level. If you go much below that, there is a lot of missing data as a result of cloud cover, algorithm failure, and also land masking. So we've got large spatial images over time. As I mentioned, we're interested in calibration and validation where we can with lakes that we have in situ data for. We obviously don't have in situ data for all 1,000 lakes. Um, and we're thinking about issues for missing data because even when we're at this bi-weekly or monthly level, we still have an image that might look something like this. So this is Lake Victoria. So we've got quite a lot of gaps. So the types of approaches that we've been developing are thinking about things like bivariate functional mixed models where we build in a state space approach as well in order to estimate the spatial temporal patterns over time, but also interpolate our missing data and give uncertainty measures attached to that. For the calibration and validation, we've been developing functional downscaling approaches through a Bayesian framework so that we don't have issues of change of support in both space and time. And the main question that we're really interested in is the very broad, is there coherence? And by coherence, we're thinking about the lake water quality patterns and signals. Do we see a similar thing in lakes throughout the world? in particular clusters, for example, up to just a level of noise. Okay. So that is another project that we're involved in. The final project that I wanted to mention is our project Hydroscape. And Hydroscape pulls together both lakes 
and rivers. So we're looking across more the full ecosystem in terms of fresh water here. Again, it is a very large project that we've got within the United Kingdom, funded through NERC, Natural Environment Research Council. And this time we're very much interested in the ecosystem quality and what's happening with our species diversity over the UK. So we've got our water bodies connected in various different ways. Water bodies connected through landscape, through vector connectedness, such as population, human population connectedness, or bird population connectedness, and also linking to what I talked about earlier, we've got this hydrological connectedness as well. So what we're really interested in here is how does this connectedness in addition to what's happening in the landscape, affect our ecosystem responses. So if we look at an ecosystem response, for example, we're thinking about dragonflies, we're thinking about birds, fish, macrophyte. In terms of these species distributions, how are they affected by the surrounding land use? And does that change depending on the different layers of connectivity that we have for a water body? So in this case, we're going this time some, from something very small, so very, very small ponds within kind of one hectare, right up to the larger lakes within the UK. So that is just about all from me. So that was a bit of an overview of our paper. Two other projects that we're heavily involved in at the moment where we're leading the statistical developments. Acknowledgements, all of this funded really by research councils within the UK. In addition to the paper co-authors, I have to mention various other people at Glasgow because of course I work with a very, very large team. So Ruth, Mengi, Craig, Haffey and Anna. Other colleagues at the Environment Agency and SEPA that have been involved in the follow-on work for our river networks here. And of course all of our colleagues in both the Global Lakes and the Hydroscape consortiums. And I'll just finish with some references. Thank you. Well, con congratulations for the two awards. It's well-deserved amount of work that you have done. I think it's a massive contribution to the area of fresh water. And this is really... Uh, a major issue that faces the world today. And I think this uh, kind of contribution is quite substantial in the sense that you are drawing on people from different areas, making the answers to questions that are very relevant to the decision making and the issue of the world health as a, as a, as a whole thing. And we really uh, thank you for this uh, nice uh, presentation. And I will not ask a question first, but I think I open the floor for whoever has a question to ask. Who, who want to ask Claire? Marian? <laughs> okay, we start with Sylvia and then you. Okay. Excuse me. Can you repeat the question? So you mentioned about these monitoring sites. So, I mean, obviously, precipitation pattern is driving the flow. So a comment on how you could integrate that into your modeling. Sorry, yeah, ah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. So as you would see from this, the, the modeling has been very multi-layered and the, the paper itself only covers just one specific aspect, looking at the common spatial temporal patterns. We have done quite a bit of work um, in the first instance using the spatial stream network models from Peterson for Hoof, looking at building in the additional covariates, the land use, the precipitation to see what's driving that. And in some sense, that was preliminary work that's led on to this common space time work. But now it almost needs us to think about the attribution for these particular sites that we're seeing to ask the question of, well, exactly, does that make 
sense what is driving those sites to appear to be the dominant ones and you're absolutely right a lot of the time it will be things like precipitation i think he's a, an expert in water quality she wants to ask a question <laughs> well i think my question should have actually come last at the end because it's sort of one where um i sort of thinking on the motivation uh, part of what ashley talked about in in terms of climate change. So what you've done is, is really looking at the historical. Um, so, uh, well, I actually have two questions, but uh, let, uh, let me ask the first one is, if you're, if you're going to give this information to the decision makers in terms of modifying their monitoring, either protocols or, or sites, do you worry about if they cut things out and now things are changing? Um, so the water quality and the whole water regime might be changing with climate change. Um, are you going to give them some cautions? Or <laughs> yes. Thank you, Sylvia. That's a very good question. So one of the things that we're very cautious of, as I'm sure everybody is, is, <laughs> is um, making sure that it's always collaborative and it's not just a case of we're developing something and we give it to somebody else and they roll it out. For example, um, we see the, some of the methods here as being really an exploratory tool to help to inform some of this information. But the work that we're actually doing with the Environment Agency at the moment is they're actually... In, as a starting point saying, well, how actually would we just design if we didn't have this information? So if we were just starting from scratch. So at the moment they are using an approach um, based on looking at the, the generalized tessellation survey approach, where they just actually put in the information that they have from shapefiles and get it to randomly select monitoring locations that are spatially representative and then they're going to see would this be a way to actually reduce down the network so actually doing it not using any historic data at all but then in addition to that what they want to do is to put in so they're going to call that their kind of sentinel program in addition to that what they want to put in is key sites where they actually see that things have been changing over time, where they're actually getting um, a lot of information in terms of sites that are very vulnerable to the nutrients and so on. So I really see it as a, a collaborative process where these tools, they give information, they can be used, but it really needs to be done in addition with the other information. You're absolutely right to make sure that you're not just going down one particular approach that in the future isn't going to answer the questions. Uh, um, work that was done uh, quite some time ago. They then have sites where they monitor uh, in uh, uh, at different frequencies, so they have long-term sites. Yes. yes. So <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You need long arms. Um, so again, that's, that's a lot of the, the work that's been looked at, yes, by both CPAT and the Environment Agency, thinking about that some of these sites might be long-term monitoring sites, some they might just monitor once a year, some it might be four times a year, some of the sites might just come, come in and out over time. Uh, because in some of, the, some of the locations, very, very high um, up in the uplands, for example, the water is very pure, there, there's no real suggestion that things are going to be changing for a long time, but obviously as, as you move downstream, that's where more of the problems arise. So, yeah. Is there any other person want to ask a question? Uh, Non-specialist in water equality? <laughs> any, any, any? Yeah, here. In some sense, terminology. So, so the S mode PCA is what would be regarded in other literature, say the climatology literature, as empirical orthogonal functions. We've called this our kind of space time PCA, really thinking about that we're actually incorporating these weights along with the principal components analysis. But essentially, in terms of the PCA, it's just a difference in terminology in different communities. That's all. Is there any other question by anybody? Uh, we, uh, 
she will be very happy to answer just if you, you ask. <laughs> yeah, she, yeah. You want the, the mic? Okay. So I was just curious about those blue sites that you showed. You, you mentioned them, that they have a coherent trend that's quite complex, and yet they're scattered across the network. Can you just say a little bit about what those sites are and what the, that kind oh, of complex the, trend? Oh, in the clustering one, the clustering one. Um, to be honest, I can't answer that question. <laughs> that work is so new that we've not looked at it. So that is what's ongoing at the moment, yeah, is that we need to look at what, what's happening there. Yeah. Um, so, were all your monitoring um, locations put in place at the same time? Um, this was a one, wonderful talk, thank you. And I was wondering, I, I've seen situations where they've increased the number of monitoring locations over time. And so, if you're looking at um, imputing um, in the PCA, if the large-scale climate influences yeah. or something like that. I'm curious if you've thought about that sure. problem. That, yeah, it's a, a very good question as well. Yes, yeah, so in, in some sense, actually, what's happened with these networks is it's gone the other way. So they've reduced or started to reduce already the number of monitoring sites. In the um, part of the data that we looked at in the paper, at that time, the monitoring sites were fairly stable. It was moving in and out a little bit, but roughly we did have the monitoring sites are 566 monthly with, with the missing data. But in principle, that's what it should have been. However, in the more recent work that we've been doing, so really moving from about 2014 onwards in terms of their data set, they have started to reduce it down quite a lot. And for some of these sites, we now only have quarterly information. And so more recently, we've been exploring how the approaches are working, just looking at the quarterly data. And that's one of the exa last examples that I gave just on the summer was, for example, where we were working more towards that type of thing, where you might only have information at particular times of year, and how does that compare to what we would have had previously when we had a lot more information? Well, I guess, uh, you, you have any question? No. Well, I, I, I will just uh, would like to, to ask about possible extension for, 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 for this kind of thing. I think one big issue is developing some diagnostic tests for the quality of the analysis. You see, when you are fitting a model and you are looking for reduction, then the question is, what is the impact of the reduction yes. On, yes. On, on this? Because we would like you know, uh, to have this kind as part of the the tool yes. structure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we are hopefully... Um, starting a new project at the beginning of August with the Environment Agency to look at that, where we are hoping to, in the first instance, just do a very small simulation study to start to look at what would actually happen if we do take particular designs using all of the information that we've got before to see would it still answer the questions that they want to, to answer. And that, I think, is going to be quite an involved piece of work before we actually get to the simulation stage because there's a lot of questions there that um, our colleagues that we're working with, I, I don't think really know the answer to at the moment in terms of, well, what do they want to be able to detect in terms of power? What is the level of change that we want to be able to see? And what is the level of uncertainty that in some senses they would be willing to live with for reducing the monitoring network and being able to get that monitoring budget down to something more manageable. Well, uh, thank you very much. But I, I think one, one thing very quickly is to use subsampling. Yes. You see what yes. you have, the, yep. the, the sampling frame. Yeah. This is your population. And then from the sampling frame, you randomly sample or stratify or whatever it is, and you take subsamples. This will give you some idea about what kind of diagnostic, what kind of changes that is taking place. And in fact, it can help you in developing some sort of a, a, a you know, significance level or critical definition of some sort. Anyway, we enjoyed your talk. Thank you, very, you. Much. Thank you very much. And congratulations. And we are very happy with, <laughs> with your talk.
Well, the presentation is very nice. I Thank think the, the president of the society will say probably something. I yes, think. now we have a, a small ceremony uh, and uh, we are giving a plaque to, uh, to Claire. If we were doing this uh, in a social dinner, probably I would ask you to raise the, the glasses of champagne or tequila. Now it's nine o'clock in the morning, so <laughs> no way for alcohol. And, but I take this, this opportunity to share with you something about the, the life of Envirometrix uh, uh, and, uh, and the rules that uh, we are trying to use to develop uh, our community and especially regarding to, to awards. So I, I take two minutes to tell you about this awards uh, works um, and both Wiley Environmetrics Best Paper Award uh, and uh, Abdel Sharawi Young Research Award. Um, the, the, the Wiley Best Paper Award uh, starts uh, uh, very early uh, when the associate editors of the journal uh, uh, indicate to the, to the um, uh, editor-in-chief uh, on, on the system those papers that uh, can be candidate for the award. So at the end of the year, the, the editor-in-chief uh, uh, selects the five most uh, voted papers and uh, uh, give these uh, shortlisted papers to the uh, publication officer of the, of the society. He is uh, William uh, Kleiber now. And William Kleiber uh, take a, a, make a committee uh, with people from the board. In this year, the, um, the, the committee was uh, myself and Mark Genton. And then uh, we vote uh, among these five, uh, five papers and take the best one. Um, the the uh, Young Research Award um, has, uh, has been established in the early 2000s, in 2002 maybe, and uh, uh, was uh, uh, established in order to recognize and honor young investigators who have made outstanding contribution to development of statistical and quantitative approaches for research in the environmental sciences. Uh, has been stopped during the transition um, to the ISI uh, in the recent years, and then, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, has been restarted uh, last year. Uh, and uh, when we started this award, we made some uh, uh, clarification, and we, uh, um, uh, the, the board decided that uh, the award uh, is to be granted to a young research with the ties members for the pre present and the current year, and is younger than 41 years. Um, there are three main uh, um, um, parameters to be considered outstanding contribution to environmental statistical um, literature, uh, strong in this interdisciplinary work, and the uh, third parameter is contribution to the environmental community. The committee was chaired by Jorge Mateo this year, and the uh, committee members were Noel Cressy, uh, Marian Scott, and Hao Zhang. So not people from the board, but outstanding people from the environmental society. So now, uh, this may be boring or interesting for you, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, now, we, uh, maybe we go there for the picture. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Uh, uh, Abdel, please come. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so this is in recognition of outstanding contribution to environmental, statistical, and quantitative research with a special focus on water quality. And water is one of the main topics of uh, the Environmental Society since long time. <laughs> For a long time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.